economic stratification. Cohesion within the community, the black community, the Hispanic community, what have you, is problematized by economic stratification. There are those within the community that have lots. There are those within the community that do not have as much or don't have any. Um, and it is this economic stratification that causes conflict within the community, intra-communal. Number two, um, persistent racism refuses to acknowledge the relevance of economic redistribution. I mean, this is all Coles right here, so that um, the norm, those in power, hegemony, uh, denies denies redistribution as social. That's all. They're going to deny this re redistribution of wealth as socialist, right? If you are saying that we are wealthy, and obviously you, you recognize that there's an overlap now, you can map on directly, you can pull this um, class-based theory and in a sense slap it right onto this notion of normative whiteness so that there's no surprise that um, sort of holistically, the wider you are, the more you are, um, the more you own, the less white you are, the less you own. That's sort of how the structure of uh, our social structure has been constructed, right? And all of this, um, theoretically and, and in real life, obviously, has its roots in slavery. Those individuals that were um, forcefully taken and abducted from the continent weren't accessible, weren't privy to the products of their labor. Right? They weren't privy to the economic wealth that was amassed from their labor. So that their labor was valuable because it produced profit for others, those others were able to acquire more for themselves and leave those um, laborers um, uh, unable to have for themselves, right? So that we have both the stratification um, economic stratification, but also this normativized um, stratification of, of whiteness, right? This hierarchical um, branching of whiteness. This is where the whole colonialism discourse is almost entirely structured within this discourse, right? There's, there's overlapping aspects, but the vast majority of colonialism and imperialism, it, uh, that discourse is, is situated within this uh, overarching discourse on normative whiteness. And then last, nation-based theory, right? So, last is nation-based theory. Um, so the goal for, the goal for the discourse on nation-based theory is decolonization process and personhood, right? There's a shift from race discourse to diasporic identity, right? Um, this idea of diasporic identity is, is really, really fascinating and um, uh, entertaining the concept of incorporating a, a larger discourse on um, diasporic theory. Um, but we'll see, we'll see how much time I have left that I can devote to uh, this lecture series. I think we're already like eight or nine hours into the discussion. Right? So the process of decolonization is a process of allowing the individual community to identify themselves right? so that we arrive at collective identity but the collective identity isn't appropriated, right? right? We don't want this. Right? We don't want collective identity as appropriated in the following manner. Right? This would be um, uh, the whole point of colonization. The whole point of colonization is to appropriate collective identity, and I gave you um, citations earlier that demonstrated this point uh, in previous discourses, right? The idea of collective identity within um, an imperialist sort of colonial aspect is that the colonial master, the colonial, colonial master extracts from the population, right? So we have, you know, larger population, right? But extracts an individual from the population, this person, extracts from the population the interpreter and this is the interpreter I-N-T-E-R-P-E-R-T-E-R 
That's really, really small, I apologize. But um, in the discourse, the, and I'll make it bigger, right? The colonial master um, extracts the interpreter from the population, serves as a liaison with the interpreter, right? Serves as a liaison with the interpreter. So master comes in, extracts the interpreter, serves as a liaison with the interpreter, indoctrinates the interpreter, right? So then indoctrination, right? Indoctrinates the interpreter and then allows the interpreter to indoctrinate the, the indigenous population, right? So master comes in, the master's trying to form the collective identity of the indigenous population. Master comes in, colonial master comes in, um, extracts the interpreter class as a group, um, indoctrinates the interpreter class, and then allows the, obviously indoctrinates the interpreter class into this normative civilized whiteness, and then allows the interpreter class to further indoctrinate the population. Then the interpreter, um, then the master class, quote unquote, the master class can withdraw and allow the indoctrination to multiply. Self-policing becomes issued, indoctrination becomes an issue because now um, they have bought into, right, they have absorbed the belief of the colonial master. And insofar as they absorb the belief of the colonial master, they have willfully put the shackles on their own mind, right? The Africans, uh, as I showed you in the, um, the argument for their enslavement, uh, the vast majority of the population of Africans at the time refused that, right? They paid homage and respect to their ancestors. They paid homage and respect to their spiritual, um, cosmological understanding of the, of the world. And they paid dearly for that, right? They paid dearly for, they, they paid with their lives, right? And they paid with their continent, and they paid with the resources that Africa has, right? Um, and the question is, you know, which is better? I, I don't really know. Um, they're both bad. So you have two ways of forming this collective identity. The first way is that the master gives you your identity, and that's horrible. But what you want to do is you want to be, this idea of nation-based theory, is that you want to form collective identity independent to this colonial master, right? You want to be able to identify who and, who and what it is that you are independent to the colonial master. So the decolonization process shifts my recognition from this relationship to the colonial master, right? So I I recognized, right, that I have been indoctrinated, right, I have been indoctrinated, I have been indoctrinated, and the process of decolonization is an attempt to extract, right, that indoctrination. I want to remove that, right, I want to purge, I want to purify, I want to reject the indoctrination of my colonial master, right? So this is a, a sort of conceptual purgation. Right? I want to purge the um, colonial master's indoctrination of my people through the interpreter class. Um, and insofar as I purge that, I put it outside of me, I now have the ability. So step one is to purge this indoctrination. Right? That would be step one. Step two would then be to recognize my collective identity. Right? Then now I have sort of me without the indoctrination, and now I have the responsibility to identify who I am, right? right? I have the responsibility to identify myself, right? This responsibility is a, a very difficult uh, responsibility, and anyone will tell you, usually after post-independence, you know, decolonization, well, colonization, decolonization, independence, and then probably it's, it's almost invariably going to be violence, right? Because it's a very, very, um, it's a, the, the, the national catharsis, the national purgation of that colonial mastership typically results in uh, a feverish attempt to try and identify who is, it is that we are. And we recognize that this identity is going to be collective identity. So it's hard because I might want to identify myself and our people as such. And you might, same lineage as me, might not want to identify our people as such. And thus we have conflict, right? This is why um, uh, uh, 
polymorphic descriptive accounts